Today, our special guest is Dr. Molly Maloof. She is a physician and Stanford lecturer who has spent her career providing personalized medicine services for health optimization. Since 2012, she has worked as an independent advisor or consultant for over 50 companies throughout the world, needing help with clinical strategy, scientific development, and product development. She is the founder of Adamo Biosciences, which is focused on developing evidence-based approaches to improving connection for stronger relationships. She is launching a new book this month called The Spark Factor, which is the ultimate guide to supercharging your energy, becoming resilient, and feeling better than ever. Who couldn't use that? Today, we'll be discussing human relationships, sexuality, love and attachment, healing trauma, and how psychedelics can be important tools for expanding the health span. Thanks so much for joining us, Molly. Thanks for having me, Allie. Sure. So I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you to um, give us a talk on this sure. amazing topic. I'm really interested to hear what you're going to be presenting today. Yeah. So one of the things that I was learning about when I was teaching at Stanford and I was preparing this course a few years ago called Live Better Longer, Extending Health Span for Longer Lifespan, uh, was this topic of human relationships and health. And I felt like I had kind of overlooked something that was really important to longevity. And, and it wasn't until I was teaching about health span that I, I realized just the level of influence that relationships have on our health. So it turns out that close personal relationships, specifically close personal positive relationships, are the greatest factor that we know in longevity and happiness. And this is based on um, epidemiological research, as well as this Harvard study on um, men that was over men and their progeny over 80 years. And they basically found that early in men's lives and their and their children's lives, they all thought that it was fame and fortune that created um, happiness. But actually when they were followed up with them later on in life and they were reflecting on their lives, they pretty much unanimously said that it was actually close personal relationships that impacted their happiness. Um, and if you look at the blue zones, I mean, the one thing that they all have in common is community and human connection is a big, big piece of the reason why people live so long. And I have an entire lecture on this topic, but today we're really gonna talk about love and psychedelics and how these things may work together for us or against us. Um, and really how can we approach this topic from a place of understanding the risks and the benefits and the pros and cons of these different medicines for our uh, connection. So I'm gonna start with talking a little bit about um, you know, this concept of, of love through the, lens of, 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 through the lens of evolutionary biology. Because I don't think a lot of people really understand why we evolved love, um, but it turns out that it's thought by certain evolutionary biologists that we evolved love, because, and specifically human homo sapiens evolved the capacity to love, uh, because essentially love was like a motivational force that would bring people together so that they could share information and resources, because this would enhance survival of both individuals and the tribe. But then also the greatest factor in the chances of reproduction is literally proximity, right? So it's the closeness if you have with others that increases the likelihood of reproduction. So love, we really basically evolved to like bring us together, literally to share information resources and enhance the chances of reproduction. And also because human connection is more likely to enhance your ability to survive long-term. So there's different kinds of love, right? Like there's, um, there's the love love of what we have for ourselves. There's, there's the love that we have for, there's basically, um, let's get into like what the, before we go into like the deep science of love, let's talk a little bit about sort of the history of, of love in Western society. So the Greeks saw love in many different ways. There was philosophia or self-love, agape or the spiritual unconditional love described by religious and altru and the, the religious and altruistic. And that was kind of how I learned about love as a child. I was raised very Christian, but um, I no longer practice Christianity, but I still do believe that this concept of unconditional love is a really fascinating topic. But in particular, what I started studying for my own company was romantic love, because I really wanted to understand how love worked and how do love drugs work. And as it turns out that the Greeks really had understood romantic love fairly well. There was eros or romantic love. That's the passionate expression of sexual desire. And I think that this correlates to 
um, to dopamine. So dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters of romantic love. And this is the hormone of significance, of meaning, of, of desire, of like really finding pleasure in another person. And then there's the mania of love, right? The limerence of, or the, the kind of love that makes people excited and obsessive and sometimes jealous during the courtship period. I think this correlates to norepinephrine, which is also uh, one of the facets of, of, of romantic love. And, ro and norepinephrine is really a stress hormone that creates a sense of um, you know, intense obsessiveness. And you, it's kind of like the, I can't eat, I can't sleep you know, the, the kind of like, I can't stop thinking about this person. And then there's the ludus or the playful love that makes you feel lit up, happy and joyful during the infatu infatuation phase. And I think this kind of correlates to serotonin, which is, you know, the, the happy hormone. Um, but after a person falls in love with someone, then comes attachment. And it's thought that basically we evolved romantic love as a commitment device because the more a person mates with a partner, the more likely they are to attach to this person and the deeper the attachment, the, the higher likelihood that a person is going to end up um, being connected to this person and raising a family with them, having a child and actually ensuring that's child survival. And oxytocin is, is really a big piece of the neurobiology of attachment as well as baseline. But we really think about oxytocin as this hormone of safety, trust, and love. And, um, and then we think of vasopressin is the hormone of defense, aggression, and protection. So when people protect and defend those I love, that's really vasopressin talking. And when, when, you, when you are with a loved one and you're holding them and you're touching them, you get this oxytocin from that human connection. And oxytocin is a really important hormone because it's also correlated to heart health. And it actually is an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant, which makes it protect the mitochondria. And that makes your energy, the energy, these are the energy origin organelles, they function better. And it also it improves your, your heart health. So the Greeks saw this as pragma or the mutual enduring love of long-term relationships or philia, the affectionate love you feel for your friends or storgia, the familiar parent-child bond we feel for our family. So it's funny that there, there's all these kinds of loves described in Greek history, but there's neurobiology to correlate with it, right? Like it turns out that, you know, social connection is extremely important for, um, we essentially, humans fundamentally need social connection for sur to survive. It helps us maintain closeness to others, which we perceive as safe and protective and strong social bonds protect us from feeling isolated and lonely. And it's our emotional ties to others that help us promote psychological equilibrium. So when you're feeling sad and you hang out with a friend, that makes you feel happier. And, um, it's been shown that, that through research that lack of social connection contributes to ill health more than obesity, smoking, or high blood pressure. And even I've, I've, I've read actually even more than sedentary behavior. So we've been so focused on, you know, these public health measures to enhance longevity. But I think it's very much time that we start thinking about social connection and love as, as important as anti-obesity okay, campaigns, anti-smoking campaigns, and campaigns for measuring human blood pressure and, and trying to get people to move more because it's something that we can, we can really all work in. And I also believe that um, part of the reason why you see indigenous tribes, you know, encourage, like, basically they, 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 they usually have group psychedelic experiences, especially in things like the Santo de Aime tribe of South America, you know, psychedelics are baked into the communal structures of how people interact. And it's, I really believe that that what we're seeing today is there's a bit there's a lot of different ways that psychedelics are being used to improve health, right? So there's the religious. There's like people using these as sacraments. And this is definitely part of indigenous cultures. But then there's the medicinal. And then there's sort of like the the movement in psychedelics to create psychotherapeutics and pharmaceuticals. And then there's also what I would call the recreational of people using psychedelics in recreational contexts. But I do think that a lot of the reasons why people do use psychedelics recreationally is for this human connection piece. Um, so what, what we're gonna talk a little bit more today about is we're gonna talk about what are certain medicines that are being used in the context of human health and relationships and, and how they work and what are potential, what does the future potentially look like based on the new research? So the first drug I'm gonna talk about is ketamine. So ketamine is, ketamine is really the only legal psychedelic that we have today. And that's because it's been around for a long time. It was really 
you know, really started to be um, used in medicine during the Vietnam and that would help people who were, you know, injured in the battlefield go through field surgery. So it made its way into anesthetics and anesthesia. And doctors noticed that certain people were improving their mood when they were exposed to ketamine. And so it started becoming, and there's a great book called the ketamine papers that basically court like collates all of this research on the history of ketamine, but basically ketamine had started to make its way into modern medicine through um, the fact that it's been helping people with mood disorders, things like anxiety, depression, and even trauma-based disorders like PTSD. Um, but certain doctors and therapists are also using ketamine for couples therapy. And this is being, you know, commercialized in private practices across the country. But basically, I've spoken to different physicians who have basically combined ketamine therapy with things like Imago, which is a type of psychological um, therapy to help with conflict resolution between indiv individuals and help with connection between individuals. And the sort of gist of Imago therapy is that when you approach your partner and you're able to mirror to them what they're feeling and able to empathize with them how they're feeling, what they're feeling, and then validating their experience, what they do is they feel very seen and heard. But when people are in a conf conflicting situation, oftentimes it can be challenging for them to really put themselves in this other person's position. Ketamine is a dissociative. And so what it does is it kind of kind of removes you from your ego identity and enables you to kind of step outside of yourself and examine reality from like a third person's perspective. So this is certainly off-label use of ketamine, but I do think that it's an interesting um, way that it is being used in, in, at, by, doc, by doctors who are engaging in couples therapy and helping couples really um, connect with one another. Usually the doses are much lower doses than are used in um, you know, a, a therapeutic setting. So when someone's going to get IV or IM ketamine, they're getting much higher doses and they're usually with an eye mask on and they're going into these deep states for individual work, right? Working through your own issues as, as an individual. But when I've spoken to doctors who are using ketamine for couples therapy, they're doing much lower doses, um, what they would call psycholytic doses, doses that are enabling you to sort of break down a little bit of the tension of the, or the psychological barriers to enable you to speak more freely to your partner. Um, in terms of other um, psychedelics that are being studied for human connection, another big one is MDMA. So MDMA is a fascinating tool because it does actually increase the same neurobiology as romantic love. So it increases dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and oxytocin, and does a lot of other things as ketamine does a lot of things as well. These are very multidimensional substances, but the interesting thing about MDMA is that MAPS is a company that is commercializing MDMA for PTSD. And we know that PTSD has massive effects on human relationships. It can affect a person's ability to stay in a, in a long-term relationship. It can affect a person's sexual function. It can cause, um, you know, anxiety. It can be, it can con contribute to symptoms of anxiety and depression. People experience flashbacks and they experience a lot of hypervigilance and, and like nervous system hyperreactivity, which can lead to real problems and conflicts in relationships. So when people go to get MAPS therapy in these clinical trials, they're essentially going into a room with a therapist after a lengthy preparation period, and they're putting on an eye mask, and, and sometimes they have music playing, sometimes they, they don't, but they basically have this experience where they're going inward, and the therapist is kind of letting them explore their subconscious and explore their inner world and really help them tap into those painful memories, but because they're coming at it from a place of feeling a sense of love and connection, they're able to really reconsolidate those memories from the implicit memory where it's still being experienced as present moment stress to that's a past memory. That is a long-term memory. I no longer have to react to that memory as though it's unsafe. It's a really profound tool because of the amount of oxytocin that's released. And it's thought that oxytocin in such large quantities can reactivate this emotional, the sort of social reward learning pathway that is characterized by early life learning with, with, with parents and child, children. So um, there's a lot of different hypotheses of how MDMA works, but Anne Wagner is a study uh, is a researcher in Canada, and she's doing research on how MDMA can help with couples and help them resolve conflicts and help them improve their relationships. Interestingly, I spoke to Rick Doblin from MAPS, and he said before MDMA was banned, 
it was actually used in 500,000 people, uh, or at least 500,000 doses were administered before it was banned. Um, and it was largely being used in couples therapy to help people overcome, you know, relationship challenges. So um, anyway, in some of the MAPS trials, they did what's called conjoint therapy, which is really fascinating. And it was actually a therapy that was essentially taking the two individuals in a relationship, giving them their own MDMA therapy in the same room, but they were not necessarily together taking the medicine touching, but they were given the medicine to like in the same vicinity. So um, I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more interesting research come out of MDMA therapy. There's companies that are studying it for sexual dysfunction, uh, including my own company. And I think that it can certainly, I mean, the number one cause of, sec, of, of PTSD is actually sexual trauma. So I think that there's a major opportunity to help heal sexual dysfunction secondary to trauma using uh, MDMA assisted therapy and frameworks for integration that can help people really address the um, sexual dysfunction. But this is going to take some time to study and there's going to be a lot of research that's going to need to come before this is ready for prime time. Um, mushrooms or psilocybin is being studied for um, treatment resistant depression. But there's all sorts of people studying it for all sorts of indications because it's such a multi, it's a very multidimensional substance, but it's, an, it's a 5-HT2A receptor agonist and it can reliably induce mystical experience in people and actually lead to profound shifts in, in an individual's consciousness and lead to lasting changes in personality, such as increased openness and decreased neuroticism. So for people who struggle with mood disorders, um, psilocybin and even addiction and suicidality, psilocybin has had, it has the potential to really impact these conditions. Um, it's, uh, it, it's definitely one of those things that we should be paying attention to. Um, and some people even describe it as an aphrodisiac in low doses. So um, our company is going to be looking into studying psilocybin um, formulations for aphrodisiac purposes. And if you actually studied the encyclopedia of aphrodisiacs, um, almost every single tryptamine is in, in, in lower doses considered to be documented um, anecdotally and through you know, indigenous cultures as having the potential for aphrodisiac capacity. Now, none of these have been approved and none of these have been studied through is at least scientific, um, typical like modern scientific research, but there is a study out of Imperial College, um, Tomasa Barba basically did a, a research paper that is I think gonna be published fairly soon. And it was presented at a conference as a poster, but I'd spoken to him about his research. And what he did was he studied the effects of SSRIs and psilocybin on depression and found that for individuals who take SSRIs, it has well known, um, it, it's well known to cause problems in sexual function. Um, but what they found was for the people who took psilocybin for mood disorders, it actually improved sexual function. Now they didn't give these individuals specific questionnaires to measure specific sexual dysfunction. They only gave them questionnaires to, to, to actually examine sexual health. So Ideally, what we want to see is another study run that specifically measures sexual dysfunction and sees if psilocybin can affect sexual dysfunction. But I do think that it's early, good research that's coming out of a very reputable institution that gives us a signal towards the direction that there may be the possibility of uh, psilocybin affecting um, sexual function. That being said, according to some of the research I've done on animal studies, which we do know that these do not always correlate to human health, in rats, it's interesting that it seems like the 5-HT receptor agonist has more effects on female rats than male rats. And anecdotally, I think it's been, you know, people have admitted that, you know, certain, certain, certain some men just don't find, you know, psilocybin arousing at all. And many women I've spoken to do find it arousing, but all of this is still anecdotal and we still need to run larger studies to actually identify who is who responds to this. Is the effect the effect on the mood disorder? Is the effect the effect on the sexual function itself? We really haven't been able to delineate this because the research hasn't been finished or, or, or performed. Lastly, I wanna talk about marijuana. And marijuana is also a psychedelic, but uh, most people don't see it that way, but it, because it is, you know, you have to take larger doses to feel the psychedelic effects, but it certainly is a psychoactive medicine. And um, it's been well established to improve sex drive and arousal. But if you have chronic use of, of, of uh, sorry, chronic, chronic use of marijuana, 
it certainly has effects on inhibiting sexual function. And similarly, ketamine use disorder is highly correlated with sexual dysfunction. So it's likely that these medicines in lower doses, aphrodisiac doses, may have effects on sexual health and relation and, and potentially helping enhance connection, which can increase the ability to, I mean, it turns out that one of the biggest facets of um, great sexual connection is great emotional connection. And we know that a lot of these medicines actually can improve one's capacity to feel more connected to the partner. But um, the reason why I'm kind of describing these medicines through the lens of you know, sexuality, love, attachment is because they're going to affect different facets of love. And so our company is in particular studying the effects of um, these psychedelics on sexual health. But we are curious about this on human relationships as well, because it's, it turns out that one of the greatest factors in sexual dysfunction is relationship problems. Um, so basically, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that, um, you know, MDMA is is definitely being, you know, people, we don't realize that MDMA, even though it is a great tool in the toolbox of potentially helping people connect, we have to be very careful with the ethics of using MDMA clinically because it is a love drug, because it does increase the same neurobiology of romantic love. And we know that romantic love is a, is a motivational, you know, force that brings people together. One of the big risks that we need to recognize in the clinical use and the commercialization of MDMA clinically is the potential chances of therapist and patient um, romantic. I mentioned earlier that you know, one of the facets of romantic love is a sense of arrows or desire. And dopamine is a hormone of desire. So it's really important for people to be properly educated about the risks and benefits of this medicine. One of the potential downsides of MDMA is the risk of a patient having or a patient or, or a therapist potentially developing um, feeling their, their, th this other person. Um, I think this is mitigated through proper training of both um, the patient and the therapist, but it needs to be really addressed out in the open, especially in educational platforms like this space, because it could potentially cause um, problems for, for patients and therapists. And there was one, um, one case of a therapist and a patient having a relationship but here's the thing I want to bring forward to any practitioners that are listening. You know, there's regardless of the use of psychedelics in clinical context, there is already a problem in um, in psychiatry and psychology. And there's actual clinical research papers that describe the fact that somewhere around five to ten percent of therapists do develop um, relationships with their clients. And this is definitely against the ethical frameworks of the American Psychological Association and the American Medical Association. So one of the things that I really try to bring up when I talk about these subjects is the importance of recognizing that you need to create really clear boundaries between the patient and the practitioner. And if you're adding medicine that's going to increase these and, and transform the feelings of your body, potentially increase the feelings of deep, intense love, it's very important that we recognize that this could be, you know, there could be transference and countertransference going on as it already is a risk in current modern psychology today. Um, and then for patients who potentially pursue MDMA, let's say down the line, we get this thing approved and then there's potential, you know, 20 years down the line, let's say there's maybe off-label use of MDMA for couples therapy, or let's say it gets approved for couples therapy by the FDA. Um, what are some of the risks of using MDMA in partnership? One of the risks is you deepen a bond with a partner that could potentially be abusive, emotionally abusive, physically abusive, or let's say you may be better off without this individual. What happens if you now have a deeper attachment to this person? And so the reason why I really want to bring this up is because MDMA is not just a drug that increases the feelings of romantic love between partners, which by the way, is part of what I think could make it therapeutic for people in relationships who have maybe lost their spark. The downside of this is, let's say you get attached to the wrong person. Let's say you get attached to the person that maybe isn't right for you. Um, you know, one of the things I want to describe is the, the science of attachment and the things that promote attachment. So there's a really important textbook. If anyone's interested in learning about attachment, the, it's called Attachment Disturbances in, in Adults, Comprehensive Repair. 
And I read this textbook and it really opened up my eyes to the power and the importance of understanding attachment in health and how this affects all of our relationships, especially if people have insecure attachment. So basically there's five factors implicated in the formation of secure attachment patterns. If these are consistently and reliably demonstrated by attachment figures. And um, one, of, one is a felt sense of safety or protection from threats or danger. The second is a felt sense of being seen. The third is a felt sense of comfort, soothing, and reassurance. The fourth is a felt sense of being valued, delighted, and desired. And the, four, the fifth is a felt sense of support and exploring the world as one's unique individual self. So during therapy, imagine you're given a drug that reduces fear signaling, as MDMA does, increases the felt sense of connection and love, induces a sense of empathy, compassion, warmth, and well-being, creates euphoria, pleasure, joy, and delight, and makes an individual feel more self-confident. This could significantly enhance the capacity of deepening attachment. And that attachment may be deepened between the patient and their therapist or the patient and their partner. So if used properly with proper education, with proper preparation, with proper screening for right candidates, making sure that people are screened for emotional and domestic abuse separately in different rooms so that you really do identify if a person is certainly being harmed by their partner and you identify this is the right person for this medicine. This increased attachments and, and deepening of secure attachment, healing attachment wounds through the use of medicine like this, I think could be profoundly helpful for all sorts of different mental health conditions. But again, the downside is like, if you really wanna make sure you're directing this energy to the right person and making sure that you're properly integrating your experience with your partner or with your, your therapist. Um, so I'm wondering if we want to, you know, talk about, um, you know, the, the, the sort of history of psychedelics in, in sexual health or the potential of psychedelics uses aphrodisiacs, or if we want to kind of pause here and go into any of the topics that we've already discussed. Yeah, thanks. You've covered quite a bit already. And um, <laughs> you've brought up some really interesting ethical challenges. That, yeah. Um, I myself haven't even thought of so clearly about the potential of this increased attachment to a, a partner or situation mm -hmm. that might not be uh, going in a positive direction. Yeah. Um, so along those lines, I am curious about the concept of how these psychedelic substances, we know that there's a therapeutic framework that might be addressing the relationship, the yeah. internal processes that are happening, but is there any scientific evidence about this idea of increasing libido or that the drug could actually be used uh, not during therapy, but maybe actually in the bedroom? Yeah. I mean, this is one of the biggest questions in modern psychedelic medicine today is like, is it safe for people to combine psychedelics in a sexual context? And um, I'm going to preface this with, you know, I have personally witnessed um, a lot of, um, I've, I've spoken to, I, I, so here's the thing I'm going to give a background information on. So I am working on developing a psych, a drug agnostic sex therapy that can be used with or without a psychedelic medicine or with or without a, um, other pharmaceuticals that may be available. Um, in general, sex therapy hasn't really been innovated in about 50 years. So it's, it's, there's an opportunity to just develop a new sex therapy. Um, but one of the things that, uh, I, I, I realized during the process of trying to evaluate, evaluate what would a protocol look like for improving sexual health? Um, I, I discovered there was a minefield of risk and I had to really slow down the development of my products and my company, because I realized that I was kind of opening a Pandora's box of, um, of challenges. And I think it was more important to ensure human safety and do the, do really good research and do a really deep analysis of the risks and benefits before launching any products, because the most important thing that we do is no harm. As a physician, I took an oath and I wanted to make it really clear to, you know, my, my team that like, we need to really know our stuff before we commercialize anything in this space. So what I really focused on is really doing the research first and really getting this like deep understanding of this entire landscape. And in the process of doing that, I came across a great researcher, an ethicist, Brian Earp, who wrote the book, Love Drugs. 
And he wrote this incredible book that I highly recommend any practitioners out there to read. And it's really about all of the potential benefits and pitfalls of medicine that can transform the way we feel about, um, you know, our, that can tra transform our neurobiology and activate the feelings of love. Um, and at the same time, there's another book that was actually, I would say, fairly well written and well cited, but also took some liberties and it's um, and it's and it created a hypothesis about human history and evolution that I don't know is backed up with research or not. But it's called it's a book called Transforming Orgasms, and it's about cannabis and psychedelics and the potential of the role of these substances in human evolution. And what they hypothesized was that these medicines enhance human connection and they were found pretty much in every single facet of the world. There's psychedelics. I mean, there's, an, there's a really great book called the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants and all across the world and every single continent, there are psychoactives and many different types of psychedelic plants. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's about this thick. And um, there's an, also the book called the Encyclopedia of Aphrodisiacs. And so I read both of these textbooks because I'm very deeply curious. And what I was, when I was preparing a talk for um, this, com this conference called Delic, it was 2021, um, I was doing research on psychedelics and aphrodisiacs because I was really curious. Like, I want to know everything I can about this topic. And as I was doing this, this presentation, I discovered that almost every single psychedelic that I've heard of was listed in the book of psychedelic, the book of aphrodisiacs. And they were all in the encyclopedia of, 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 of um, psychoactive plants. So in the book, Transforming Orgasms, the authors basically hypothesized that maybe humans evolved with psychedelics and maybe it enhanced our ability to um, drop into states of resonance emotionally and physically and, and, and enhanced rhythmic, rhythmic sexual contact. And one of the things that is kind of well known about psychedelics is that it basically can enhance this sense of connection to another partner. And what I found when I was actually um, researching, um, you know, this, when I was doing this, reading this book and reading these textbooks, I was like, you know, why, why would, and why, and I actually, last night I gave a presentation at a, at a, um, a little mini, you know, group in LA and I gave a talk on the same topic we're talking about today. And I actually asked the crowd, like how many here have ever combined psychedelics with in a sexual context and more than half the room raised their hand. And I was so surprised, but I mean, this is a self-selecting group that wanted to learn about these topics. So it was more likely to be a group that had probably experimented. But I mean, this is a frontier space. Like there's not tons of literature in, in PubMed on this topic. So sometimes you have to go out and just talk to people. So I was interested in understanding like what is, so I'm kind of in this place of doing field research, right? I'm like going out and talking to people and finding out what they're doing. Um, and so basically people often experience a profound sense of connectedness while they're engaged in sexual activity involving cannabis and psychedelics. Uh, and this can manifest as a connection to a partner an inner connection to oneself, and even a sense of connection to the earth. And this doesn't necessarily happen every time, but, but there's, there's usually a wide spectrum of intensity. But it's interesting that this has been documented and there it is kind of like a well-known story of the 60s. Now, I wanna really preface all of this with, I am not advocating that people go and experiment with these medicines in a sexual context because there are risks. And so, if you are going to listen to this, this you know, webinar, I'm not here telling you that this is what I'm prescribing to you. I am letting you know this is what I'm observing, but this is not a prescription and this is not a recommendation. This is a uh, reflection on the research that I have found. And this is also me coming out and saying, let's talk about some of the downsides that I've seen in the world. So I've been out talking to therapists who are sex therapists and psychotherapists who have a psychedelic practice and who have actually published papers on psychedelics and healing sexual trauma or psychedelics and, um, and sexual function or psychedelic, or, or maybe they are literally observing psychedelics and the underground. And they're, and they're actually, in some cases, integrating people who have been traumatized by underground therapists because 
in the context of their therapeutic journey, certain participants have been touched by their therapist in inappropriate ways. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you are under the influence of a psychoactive medicine or under the influence of alcohol, which is a psychoactive, you have lowered inhibitions and you may not also know how to respond appropriately to unwelcome advances. And, or you may not, um, you may feel something pleasurable, but feel very uncomfortable in the moment and find a deep sense of conflict inside you, which is totally expected. And I think it's so important that we have, we, we talk about the fact that there are people that are getting traumatic, that are having traumatic experiences in the underground psychedelic space because their therapists at the time is what I've been told by these up above ground therapists that are clinically licensed, that are working with ketamine assisted therapy, that are literally going and integrating people who've been harmed by underground therapists. They're telling me that essentially what's happened to them, these participants, is that you know they go into this experience thinking that this therapist is going to help them heal their trauma. And instead, during the experience, the therapist touches them in places that are inappropriate. And to me, what's crazy to me about this is what I've been told is that these underground therapists actually think that what they're doing is healing. And I'm going to preface this with, there are, I, I've have, I have friends that are entrepreneurs and that have, that have come to me and said, well, I once went to a tantric practitioner and literally told them I want to experience psychedelics and I want to heal this traumatic experience that I had with my sexuality. And I willingly had them touch me. So this is like, a, basically when you go into the underground, you start talking to people, you discover there is a massive gray area of what's, what's considered right and wrong. But I generally personally believe that you should not be touched by your therapist um, consensually. And even if you are under the influence of a psychedelic, you shouldn't probably have consensual touch with a therapist because you're under an altered state and there's a power differential. And that power differential puts you in a position where they're more experienced, more educated, and more um, and and supposed to be in a position of healing, and there really should never be, I believe, a therapeutic sexual touch by a by a physician by, by a physician or a psychologist or a shaman that a sexual touch in a psychedelic context. That is my personal belief after doing all the research on ethics that that just should not happen. And the reason why I say this is because when I see people going to therapists to have to integrate their experience that that has really caused them sexual trauma it's a really big problem and it's and it's not okay and it shouldn't be happening and it, and these people do feel harmed and very deeply conflicted about their experiences so that's what i'm going to preface this with you have to talk about the risks before you go into the benefits so let's talk a little bit about why couples are combining psychedelics in a sexual context yeah sure uh, yeah, just real quick before we move on, thanks for laying out those risks that is very concerning and, and why, you know, I think the need for regulation and people 100%. have opportunity to work with people that are licensed or credentialed in some way and right. have some type of board oversight becomes very important. Um, but on the same time, you know, we educate people that might be taking psychedelics um, at a festival or with some friends. And yes. Um, if you would have, could you talk a little bit about those? Yeah. Things? Cause it does seem like a lot of this could apply or that clinicians might want to make sure that their yeah. clients are aware that of, I mean, a lot of the same things you just discussed can happen yeah. in, in that context. So one of the things that we're really doing with our therapy we're, de we're designing is there's this entire gray space between emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. And a lot of what happens with sexual trauma is this space is not clearly defined between two people. And so what will happen is that something will happen in this space between emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. And because there's no language in this space and people aren't communicating, they may experience a traumatic, a traumatic event. And when you're at a festival and you are taking medicine that transforms your consciousness in dark spaces, while there's dancing, um, I'm just going to give an example of, I, and this is not necessarily me on medicine, but I was in the, in a crowd of people that were taking psychedelics or who were drinking and it was at Burning Man and I was just dancing and some guy ran up to me and he picked me up 
And he started shaking me uncontrollably and was screaming, I love you. Now, I did not anticipate somebody assaulting me with just, I mean, arguably he didn't um, touch me in any of my, you know, any genitals or anywhere else, but he, he had grabbed me and I couldn't get, I couldn't let go. And it was deeply, deeply uncomfortable. And as a, as a person who's experienced sexual trauma, it was a very huge trigger for me to feel like. I didn't have control over my body. And so if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. Um, Burning Man is supposed to be a safe space, but it isn't always a safe space. And like, even though I felt innocently dancing crowd of people to some music, I was picked up and I was essentially assaulted by a stranger. Now I have heard many, many stories of people who have had even worse experiences at music festivals where they you know, someone said, Hey, I want to go back to your tent and let's, let's cuddle. And before they knew it, cuddling turned into a sexual assault. And the thing about it is that because you are, if these people are under the influence of psychedelics or other substances, they don't always have, um, you know, they don't, and there's often polypharmacy going on at festivals. People don't always have the same level of agency or the capacity to necessarily speak up and say, Hey, this doesn't feel right. And, or they may feel, okay, that feels good, but then it crosses over the line into, no, 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 I don't want this. And, and maybe the other person doesn't listen. And so it's one of my personal missions that we fight sexual assault in this world and we heal sexual assault in this world, but we have to prevent it from happening in the first place. And so the best way to prevent these things is for people to realize, especially for those people out there, by the way, who've had a previous history of trauma, what can happen to you if you have been traumatized in the past is there's a thing called polyvagal theory. And so in a state of threat, the nervous system will, will respond in different ways. One of the ways it will respond is it will freeze. And not everybody realizes that the freeze response is actually a dorsal vagal protection response. That's actually part of the parasympathetic nervous system that typically gets activated when a person cannot escape. So they will, when people say, well, they didn't fight back. So how could it be rape? That actually means that this person was literally frozen like a deer in headlights because they couldn't get away from danger. So this is a big issue with the space of the, of intimacy where somebody may be in a context where they don't feel that they can escape the danger that they're in and they freeze up. And then the other person doesn't hear them say, stop, I don't want this because they're, they're so stunned and frozen that they can't move. And to me, this is like, this is one of the biggest reasons why sexual assault can happen to people is because they don't, the, the other person doesn't see the body language. But if, if, if a person is not physically moving or responding to your advances, that's a body language. And yet no one's taught this because we don't teach sex, sex, edu sex education in grade school and high school properly. So we're not really taught that when someone doesn't like something, they don't always say, I don't want this. I can't, I, I, I want to, I don't want you to stop. Sometimes they can't communicate because they're in such fear. And in particular, people who have previous traumas are more likely to be traumatized specifically because of their nervous system wiring. So that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm out trying to teach people about this stuff, because if you can, you know, walk away or move away or run away from a dangerous situation, that's great but recognize that a person may not always be able to do that. There's also this thing called the fawn response. And it's when people basically go along with the behavior because they don't feel like they can actually, like fawning is really fascinating. It's basically when people, maybe they don't, maybe internally they feel like they don't want something, but they, but they, be, but because they feel unsafe or threatened, they actually please the person that's um, potentially assaulting them. And they do that because they don't want to be injured or hurt. So that's another big issue that can happen. And this is part of the reason why what we're doing is developing a sexual um, health protocol that, that like really focuses on teaching people about body language, teaches people about how to understand when someone is saying yes with not just their voice, but also with their body and actually wants what the, this other person wants at the same time. Yeah, that's such important education to put out there. And, you know, the other kind of spectrum of this is some of these substances, when you get in higher doses like ketamine or GHB, yeah. we know that, you know, people aren't uh, consciously connected to their bodies anymore, and that can be a risk. 
The other side yep. of it is maybe you're just disinhibited and you make bad judgment calls that you regret the next day. I think there's a lot uh, of chance of that happening with psychedelics, yep. alcohol, anything like that. So just um, as people are preparing or questioning if this is the right choice for them, uh, really thinking through all the possibilities that could come up and how to handle those situations right. uh, is a, a great, great approach. Yeah. So yeah, I'll let you move on to the, the next topic you want sure. to Sure. I mean, so I was really curious about what was, I mean, if you're going to try to develop a sex therapy, like what is the goal you're trying to achieve, right? Like, what do you want people to get to? And right now, most modern sex therapies aim is to just eliminate dysfunction. And main, main dysfunction is lack of desire, which is kind of like a lack of emotional arousal. Is my, does my brain want this? Lack of um, physical arousal, which is, does my body respond to sexual cues? And am I actually becoming aroused, engorged, and uh, in women's cases, you know, um, you know, is there, is there moisture? And then the, then there's um, pain. So like a lot of women experience sexual pain and especially women who have a history of trauma or have, a, have, um, you know, challenges with their nervous system being dysregulated, tensing up is a very common problem for the pelvic floor. So does the pelvic floor have too much um, tension or is the pelvic floor so weak that actually it doesn't properly, um, it, it's also, it can be too weak or too, um, too, too, like sort of hypotensive or hypertensive. The pelvic floor can basically be too tight or, or too, too lax. Um, and then there's also, um, the nervous system's control of the, of the sort of sexual response. Like if you're in a state of hypervigilance, it's going to be really hard for you to actually relax and to surrender to an orgasm. Um, and so anorgasmia is one of the other facets of sexual dysfunction. It's like, can, does a person able to make it to a climax? Now there's also male sexual dysfunction, which is typically things like perf performance anxiety, which is, isn't technically considered to be a DSM diagnosis, but a lot of men complain about it. Um, and then there's things like premature ejaculation, which is sort of like the, um, male equivalent of, um, I guess there's, there's less of. It's, like, it's hard to describe, but like basically the male equivalent of the male's, you know, genitals are hyper reactive to sexual stimuli. And they're, and instead of, it's not really tension, but it's almost like the release prematurely of, of ejaculation. And then, and then erectile dysfunction is kind of the opposite of that, where there's lack of erection and lack of um, capacity to become fully engorged. So um, the nervous system is really cool because if you actually look at how it gets dysregulated, it's almost always too much of something or too little of something. And um, it's really a fascinating thing to really kind of see it globally that way. But when we're thinking about what is optimal sex, really there's this great book that did a study. They interviewed a lot of people and they were like, what specifically they interviewed people who describe having what's called magnificent sex or like extraordinary sex lives. Um, and they found that there was these major components. And the first one was being present, focused, and embodied. The second was connection, alignment, merging, feeling in sync. And the third was extraordinary communication, heightened empathy. The fourth was deep, deep sexual and erotic intimacy. The, the next was authenticity, being genuine, uninhibited, and transparent. The next was transcendence, bliss, peace, transformation, and healing. And then the next was... Um, exploration, interpersonal risk-taking, and fun. And then lastly, there was vulnerability and surrender. And the minor components were lust, desire, chemistry, and attraction. So it's really fascinating to me um, that, and then the, the second minor component was intense physical sensation and orgasm. But if you actually look at all of these facets of magnificent sex, a lot of them are things that you find in experiences of, hum of psychedelics. So basically, I'm going to just kind of like wrap up here, but basically a big piece of understanding the effects of psychedelics in low doses, aphrodisiac doses on sexual function is that they do increase a sense of presence, a sense of embodiment, sense of connection, and the sense of merging with another person. They can improve empathy and communication. They can, they can definitely lead to deep intimacy. Um, telling people that you would just, being able to say things that you wouldn't typically say, things that are left unsaid kind of giving you less, they, they, they do create disinhibition, but also there's this deep sense of authenticity you feel. And then they can lead to transcendent experiences, right? Like transformational healing experiences, as well as enabling you to surrender 
and explore, you know, your inner and outer experience. So I really think that there's an opportunity that if we really properly study this stuff, we might be able to really transform a person's ability to get over these sexual experiences that are really challenging for them. Because a lot of what really is the biggest barrier to great sex is the ability to, to get into all of these spaces and not have fear. Um, so some of the things that people can do if they just want to enhance their sexual experience with a partner is do things like eye gazing with your partner, meditation before a sexual experience, doing some breath work with your partner, getting, you know, doing some toning where like you tone, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, and you do this with your partner at the same time and you can get your body into little resonance through sound. Um, and then really getting into in, in touch with another, with your partner's bodies before penetration, even just avoiding penetration altogether can really enhance sex by just getting into physical intimacy with a partner and emotional intimacy before you actually engage in any sexual activity. And then one of the benefits that the book Transforming Orgasms describes about psychedelics and sex is this facet of rhythmic entrainment. And what people basically describe is the ability for psychedelics to enhance this trance-like state. Um, so psychedelic drugs don't cause orgasm, but they seem to improve people's timing and sense of rhythm to get past critical threshold points that can make the path to orgasm much easier to navigate. And that's what I have to, to share with you today. Okay, yeah, thanks so much for covering all that. I have just one last question, if you have a moment. Sure. Um, do you expect that as the research continues that there will be differences between um, men and women, like biological uh neurobiological effects that we might see differences in how these substances might work on the topic of connection and intimacy. I do think that, um, I really do think that it's possible they can help both, but I do think that it will potentially, because of the, I, I've spoken to quite a lot of men about how psychedelics may impair sexual function, I do think that one, it's, it's interesting that I think that one of the benefits of psychedelics is the fact that they maybe prevent people from actually going straight into penetrative sex, which can actually be part of the problem of why people struggle with, with their sexual function is that they're kind of rushing into things. But I think for men with premature ejaculation, I just, I don't, or sorry, men with premature ejaculation. Yes. I do think that they can help. And in fact, there's a company that's um, commercializing Kana. And it's a SS, it's like a profound SSRI. And I do, I do, I don't know if it's, I need to look it up and make sure it's, I don't know if it's actually cl clinically considered a psychedelic. I don't know if it fits within the category of a psychedelic, but Kana is being commercialized for premature ejaculation. I do think that psychedelics can help with that. But I think that for erectile dysfunction, I wouldn't necessarily recommend. I mean, I think, I think the psychedelics can help with the causes of erectile dysfunction that are not biological that are rooted in psychological problems, specifically trauma-based conditions or relationship problems. But I don't think that they're necessarily going to enhance a person's sexual function if, if their problem is that they can't have, uh, if, they, if they struggle with, with, their, um, with their erection. But so I, I do think that for, for men and women, if the issue that's causing the sexual dysfunction is the relationship problem, then I think it can help. But it's always about getting under the surface of like what's actually causing the sexual dysfunction to begin with. So there's biological causes of sexual dysfunction, and then there's psychological causes of sexual dysfunction. And what I'm particularly bullish on is the psychological causes of sexual dysfunction that are contributing to people's, um, you know, sexual problems. Um, and, you know, I think that relationship quality is one of the biggest fa factors in great sex. So if we can use these four couples therapy someday that may actually lead to better sex, sex for, for, for couples and, and better relationships. And, and arguably I would say that the safest space for them to be studied is in, you know, couples and committed relationships. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So much that we'll learn and including, you know, the intersection with hormone release with different types of psychedelics. Yes. And when you're getting into different doses and, and thresholds with the dosing, you're, yeah, you're triggering different things to activate in the body. So I know we have very little information about this, but I, you know, maybe in the future we could have a conversation uh, about how these different doses affect different 
um, genders Absolutely. affect different experiences and like really optimizing that depending on the specific case at hand. But I uh, totally agree with you. You know, I think a lot of times, uh, yeah, the, the core issue, especially long-term relationships is that, you know, the spark is gone. Uh, that initial like love sense that you feel when you're feel falling in love and you got to work at it. You got to do the work yeah. to keep uh, it exciting and interesting and novel and new. Uh, so I'm really interested in yeah. checking out your book, The Spark Factor. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, the book doesn't go deep into psychedelics very deeply. We talk about ketamine assisted therapy and we do talk about sexuality, love and social connection and the power of these on health. But the book also covers things like mitochondrial function, metabolism, movement, mastering stress, and it really is a comprehensive book on health and is particularly suited for women's bodies because most books on biohacking are written for men, but I've had many men read it and they loved it. And it's a great book for men who have uh, relationships with women if they want to better understand women's bodies and the difference between men and women's bodies. But it's definitely a book for everyone to read. And I would love for people to pre-order it if they can. Okay. Awesome. We'll share the link for sure. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you so today. much, Allie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Have a okay. have a great weekend. Take care. Awesome. Bye. Okay, bye.